So um, what I'd like to convince you of today is um, why studying the coral holobiont or the coral holobiont model from a microbial scale is a, an interesting and exciting thing to try and do. So it's important to understand um, the organism and the organism's role in ecosystem changes. But in relation to corals and, and what's happening with uh, corals and coral reef changes is that we actually understand relatively little about um, cell biology, host microbiology or symbiosis biology and um, the stress responses of um, the coral animal. And as we're hearing a lot about today and tomorrow is that coral reefs are undergoing rapid change and there's increased environmental stresses and um, this is resulting in increased mortality events and disease events in the coral animal. So to understand um, what's happening with corals, we need to understand how they function and how they respond to changes in their environment. The aim of the research that I'm doing is to provide a better understanding of the microscale responses of the whole coral organism, the holobiont, um, to better understand the mechanisms that can be driving um, ecosystem change from, from a coral perspective. So Betty told us about the coral holobiont before. That was proposed in 2001 by Forrest Rower and colleagues. And in 2009, um, Becky Vega Thurber and colleagues proposed an extension of this model, um, whereby the, the coral holobiont um, symbiosis or mutualistic symbiosis under various stress events shifts from a symbiotic or mutualistic interaction to a pathogenic or um, parasitic um, interaction. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that they discussed was that this could be an underlying mechanism of um, increased disease events. And there's a large body of ecological um, evidence out there now to suggest that there's strong links between stress events and um, disease and mortality events in corals. And um, there's been quite a few mechanisms that have been proposed to explain this. Um, reduced host health due to environmental stress, increased susceptibility to disease and an increased emergence of, um, of pathogens. But we really actually know um, quite, a little about, quite little about how diseases start, how they initiate and how they progress through a coral colony. And we don't know a lot about what actually occurs in the holobiont or in the host during stress that can actually result in a higher susceptibility to disease <coughs> or a reduced health. So what are the things we need to know about coral um, to be able to understand this? We need to know what and where are the symbioses and the host microbe interactions. And we need to know if these interactions actually do extend the capacity of the host or the holobiont to exist within its environment. Are they temporal and spatially stable? And are these um, interactions impacted by the environment and how they change? And we also need to know how the host and the host environment, which provides the, the basis for these interactions, interactions, is impacted by the environment. When we can um, answer these kind of questions, we can start to determine what are the significant interactions that occur between host and symbioses and environments um, which influence ecosystem change. So what I want to focus on um, today is to look at how the environment impacts the coral host. When we talk about environmental impacts to coral, um, particularly thermal impacts, we usually refer to coral bleaching or bleaching events. And when we talk about bleaching, we're defining what's happening to the animal and to the holobiont by what's happening to the photosynthetic apparatus of the algae or the um, endosymbiotic dinoflagellates. But there's also the potential for environmental stress to directly impact the host. So um, my recent research has been identifying um, the genes that are involved in apoptotic cell death. Apoptosis is a highly conserved cell death mechanism. It's found across the phyla. And some of the genes that are involved in this um, uh, controlled death uh, or cell suicide is the BCL2 family. Um, these are pro and anti-apoptotic members. They've been found in all studied metazoans. And uh, the, these are identified through shared sequence homology of a particular domain which governs the function as either pro or anti-apoptotic. <coughs> so um, in terms of coral, coral physiology, we understand more um, and more about the bleach state. Um, so what's happening during um, the loss of um, endosymbiotic um, dinoflagellates or a breakdown of the photosynthesis. 
But what's happening to the coral that gets them to this stage? What's actually happening to the animal? And that's something we don't know a lot about. Um, <clears throat> so we've recently done some experiments where we simulate um, reef flat conditions with a gradual exposure of um, thermal stress over several days. So this is actually a temperature profile from the reef flat of Heron Island. And what you can see is that there's a gradual daily increase in thermal stress and each day is followed by a nightly uh, recovery period. So we've replicated this in tank experiments with hundreds of um, branch, uh, coral branches and we wanted to look at things like the onset of the stress response, what's happening at a cellular level and what can that can tell us about um, host symbiont interactions. Okay, so first of all what we can see here is that host responses to thermal stress or coral responses to thermal stress are actually occurring prior to the onset of traditional measures of coral bleaching. What we're seeing here is um, the gene expression relative to control of heat shock proteins from both the algal host and the dinoflagellate symbiont. In red this is the bleaching threshold and then we're looking at temperatures um, below that bleaching threshold. So prior to the onset of bleaching we're seeing an upregulation in heat shock proteins in um, the coral host which is in white at three and one degree below the bleaching threshold. And we're not seeing those um, responses in the um, algal symbiont below those um, temperatures. When we look at the expression of pro-apoptotic or death genes relative to controls um, during the onset of thermal stress, we're actually not seeing um, a great degree of trend uh, looking at those temperatures. But when we actually look at the expression of anti-apoptotic or survival genes relative to control, what we can see is that prior to the onset of bleaching and at temperatures that we'd normally consider to be quite healthy for the coral, that there's a quite a large upregulation of these um, of these genes. Looking at this in a little more um, detail, if we look at the temporal variability during the day, so I mentioned before that overnight you get a recovery period where um, sea surface temperatures return to ambient, which is approximately 27 degrees. We've sampled the the corals at 8 o'clock in the morning, and then again at 12 o'clock, which is the um, maximum thermal and light stress for the day. And what we can see is that there's a, a strong temporal variation um, during that change. So particularly BCL2 um, in the top, uh, we can see gene expression of, particularly at the bleaching threshold, is only upregulated twofold, but by 12 o'clock that's upregulated to 36-fold. Um, another example, if we look at the inhibitors of apoptosis, um, throughout the um, temperature profile between the 8 a.m. and the 12 p.m. we're finding an upregulation in, um, in gene expression throughout the day. What's also interesting to take away from this is that we are getting an upregulation in the death genes um, at uh, different temperatures at the same time as there's an upregulation of survival genes. That's important to think about when we consider how we sample the corals. So when we do a bleaching experiment, we're taking entire coral br branches, homogenizing them and, um, and doing the extraction on a, a subsample of the homogenized sample. So this actually results in a homogenization of the signal from a complex colonial symbiotic entity. If we think about the coral colony, we know that there is um, significant complexity within the coral, within the coral branch and within the microbial scale. There's both environmental and biological variability within the, um, within the branch. <coughs> so we don't actually know about what's happening on the microscale and the responses within the microscale. And, um, but we do know that there are specialised habitats within a coral branch and within a coral colony. So um, the next step of this research was to try and tease apart some of these patterns and actually understand what's happening um, within the within the holobiont from a micro scale. And to do that we've used a localization approach where we are um, localizing gene expression patterns in situ to understand the micro scale. So this allows a visualization of the gene expression within the specific cells and tissues in which it's happening. And you can then couple this with um, an understanding of localization of the symbiont, um, symbiont expression as well as host expression and um, and an understanding of the microenvironment. So up here we have um, a cross-section of a coral tentacle. You can see the 
circles, sorry, the circles at the top are the algal um, endosymbionts. And the dark purple staining around the outside is an upregulation of um, host gene expression, in particular cell type around the edge of the tentacle. Okay, so um, using this approach to look at microscale gene expression in bleaching, at the top we have the, uh, one example of a death, the death gene and the bottom a survival gene. Um, at healthy, um, prior to bleaching and bleaching temperatures. And so what we can clearly see is that we're getting an, um, in the center here uh, localization of um, BCL2 expression around the uh, algal symbionts within the gastrodermal tissue layer. And that's not evident at um, healthy tissue, um, within healthy tissues. Also, what we can see is that there's an upregulation of the um, death gene following be bleaching and a breakdown of the symbiosis. <coughs> okay, so what is this telling us? Well, apoptosis is um, uh, indicative of early host responses to environmental stress. And when we couple these results with some earlier, an earlier study that's provided morphological evidence for apoptosis occurring in cells below the bleaching threshold, we can get an indication that early cellular changes, and one example being apoptosis, may be very early, may be um, very important in um, early stress responses. And these can be the removal of cells damaged by stress and preventing apoptosis in, um, in cells and, and cells and tissues during stress. One interesting example in the broader literature, BCL2 has been shown in other um, systems to uh, provide protection against oxidative stress. So the, there's a the potential here that, um, that the host is actually operating very early in the bleaching threshold, um, in the bleaching uh, response to control what's happening to the organism. Um, overnight recovery periods and short and long-term recovery periods may be highly significant in the outcomes to, um, what, uh, to corals following stress events, and that's something we like to look at in more detail. But in general, what we can say is we're just beginning to understand this early stress response and the role of the whole organism response. But what we, what we do want to be able to do is understand how environmental influences can result in cellular, multicellular and symbiotic changes, not only within an individual, but also within a population. Um, and how these things drive uh, changes from a healthy to an unhealthy state. So where to from here? Well, the future challenge really is to integrate these kind of studies into broader um, studies of coral ecosystem change. And um, we, we hope to take this a step further um, with metagenomic and metatranscriptomic approaches coupled with localization approaches to really understand what's happening with the host and their symbionts within the micro um, environment. A really interesting paper came out this year um, where they've actually called for an integration of studies which look at genes all the way through to studies that look at um, ecosystems to understand how um, changes in the Earth's climate are impacting um, are impacting important ecosystems. And they go on to argue that there's the capacity and the technological advances now to allow us to integrate reductionist or small-scale approaches into broader ecosystem studies to be able to tease apart some of the large-scale patterns that we do see um, in um, environmental scenarios. And um, I'd just like to thank um, our funding the ARC and the Centre of Excellence, as well as the Academy of Science, who have provided me the Travel Fellowship to look at some of these kind of questions in um, other environments, such as the mesophotic um, coral reefs, and all of the collaborators that have helped in this work. Nobel. <laughs> <laughs>